Dr. Rajun, uh, please unmute. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a matter of pleasure and privilege for me to introduce and welcome Professor Padmanabhan Balram, who has been kind enough to accept our invitation for delivering a keynote lecture in this special session. He is an Indian biochemist and a former director of the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India. He received the third highest Indian civilian honor, Padma Bhushan, in the year 2014. He has also received the TWAS Prize in year 1994. He has also been conferred the 2021 R. Bruce Merrifield Award by the American Peptide Society in this year 2021. Professor Balram received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from University of Pune. Thereafter, he joined Indian Institute of Technology Kanpur for his master's degree. And after completion of master's degree, he went for his PhD degree to Carnegie Mellon University, and he pursued his PhD research with uh, Excel A. Bodner by, after completion of his PhD, he gained postdoctoral research experience at Harvard University with Nobel laureate, Dr. Robert Burns Woodward. He returned to the Indian Institute of Science after completing the postdoctoral research work and he has been with Indian Institute of Science Bangalore ever since as a faculty member in the Molecular Biophysics Unit. At present, he is holding a chaired professorship at the National Center of Biological Sciences Bangalore. During his PhD, Professor Balram studied the use of negative nuclear overhauser effect signals as props of macro molecular conformations. As a postdoc with Woodward, Professor Balram worked on the synthesis of the antibiotic erythromycin. Now I invite Professor Balram to deliver the keynote lecture on a very special topic that is reflections on science in the midst of pandemic. Sir, I extend a very warm welcome to you and I invite you to deliver your lecture, sir. Dr. Arun Kumar, can I share my screen? Yes, you can share, sir. Can you see my screen now? You can see, sir. I'll make it full screen before I begin. Does it come as full screen on for you? Yeah, it's full screen, sir. Okay, fine. Uh, good morning. Uh, you know, speaking after that, I would say very thought provoking presentation, uh, which we just heard on the bombing, I find it difficult to say much about science. Because many times when we hear about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we immediately attribute the atomic explosions as a consequence of science. But it turns out that science is a double-edged sword. And that is what I would really like to discuss with you today. I've titled my talk, Reflections on Science in the Midst of a Pandemic. And on this slide, I have pictured two of the foundational pillars of the subjects that I know, chemistry and biology. Chemistry on the left, which is Mendeleev's periodic mm -hmm. table, Darwin on the right, who gave us the ideas of natural selection and biological evolution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect a little bit on science and evolution. I'm going to tell you a little bit of chemistry and a little bit of biology. I will begin with physics. In the very first chapter of the Feynman lectures on physics, he will say that matter is made up of atoms. 
And then he will ask a question. If in some cataclysm, all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of preachers, what information would contain the most information in the fewest words? The cataclysm that he would have talked about, of course, would have been nuclear war at that time. He says, I believe it is the atomic hypothesis or the atomic fact, or whatever you wish to call it, that all things are made up of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they are a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. This is the principle, really, of both physics and chemistry and of the structure of matter of how atoms bond to one another when they come close by, that gives you all the molecules of chemistry. And if you squeeze them together, then of course they repel one another. There is enormous power in the atom. And in preparing for this lecture, I found this article by Winston Churchill. Churchill, of course, is the man who led Britain to survive the Second World War. As early as 1931, Many years before the Second World War, he'd written an article in Strand magazine. The article was imagining what the world would be like 50 years hence. What would the world like it be in 1981, for instance? And here he says, nuclear energy is incomparably greater than the molecular energy which we use today. When he says molecular energy, it's the energy that we get by burning coal, for instance. And then he says there is no question among scientists that the gigantic source of energy exists. What is lacking is the match to set the bonfire alight, or it may be the detonator to cause the dynamite to explode. The scientists are looking for it. The scientists did find this, how to break the atom and release the energy. There's a very, very famous experiment done by the Italian American scientist Enrico Fermi. And he did it in the Chicago football field, where he did the first nuclear reaction. Churchill goes on to say that there are secrets too mysterious for man in his present state to know. Secrets which once penetrated may be fatal to human happiness and glory. But the busy hands of scientists are already fumbling with the keys to all the chambers, either to forbidden to man. But at this point, whether it is chemical warfare, biological warfare, or nuclear warfare, you must ask the question, is science to blame? But the answer will be, it is never science to blame. It is always people to blame. And who are those people? Those people are always those who lead countries into war. When we heard this presentation and the eyewitness account of what happened in Hiroshima 76 years ago, you can immediately see that the child of 11 who wrote that had nothing to do with the war. Neither did her father, and neither did millions of other people who died. When we think about atomic explosions, look at the two pictures that I show you. The first on the top left is the first atomic explosion on July the 16th, 1945 in the New Mexico desert at Alamogordo. That's the experiment which was done. This was a physics experiment which demonstrated the power of nuclear energy. The nucleus of the atom can now be released and it can become a formidable source of energy. It can also become a formidable weapon of war. Robert Oppenheimer, whom I picture here, exemplifies the problem that scientists, philosophers have had. Oppenheimer was a poet, Oppenheimer was a wonderful physicist, and at the age of, when he was in his early 90s, when he was in his early 40s, he was chosen to lead the Manhattan Project, which led to the atom bomb. Oppenheimer used the term Trinity to describe the first explosion. Where did he get this term Trinity? He got this term from a poem by the English poet John Bond, who said, he talks about a three-person God. That is the trinity of the Christian faith. And there you can see that this is a violent poem. He says, 
that I may rise and stand and overthrow me and bend your force, that's the force of the atom, to break, blow, burn and make me new. The world has recovered after the Second World War, but it has never been far from a third. It is always teetering on the brink of war. August 6, 1945 was followed by August 9, 1945. The war came officially to an end on the 15th of August, 1945. The 15th of August is a day that we celebrate as the Day of Independence. You can also recall that independence was achieved also at great cost of the partition. And again, millions of people died. When Oppenheimer saw the blast on the July 16th, 1945, he is reported to have quoted from the Sanskrit in translation from the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. This quote of Oppenheimer has been dissected in the decades that have followed by scholars. Was the translation correct or was the translation not quite correct? But science has always not led to bad things. Science has also been what has brought us to our state today. Remember that you are the products of science and technology. Even the fact that you're listening to me today from far away is the product of science and technology. Today, the eyes of the world are on Tokyo because the Olympics are going on there. What makes us see Tokyo in all its glory today is modern technology. At the beginning, at the end of the 19th century, right at the beginning of the 20th century, a major discovery came from physics. This was the discovery of X-rays. This was one of the first discoveries which set off the atomic revolution in physics because people wanted to understand what is the cause of all these mysterious radiations which are coming. Röntgen, the German physicist, discovered X-rays when he was doing experiments with cathode ray tubes. So he had a photographic plate some distance from the tube with which he was doing experiments. And this was a fluorescent plate and he saw that there were some rays falling on it and creating an image. He immediately called his wife and told her to put her hand in front of the plate. And what you see there is the image of Ronchen's wife's hand. It is an immortal image. This is the first X-ray photograph. And you can see what Ronchen has discovered now is the technique of radiology. We break a bone today, we go and get an X-ray done. At the time when this experiment was done, the physicists did not think it was important. But the medical doctors immediately recognized its value in diagnostic medicine. What followed afterwards was very quick. Madame Curie's discovery of radium and polonium followed Becquerel's discovery of radioactivity. Today, radiotherapy is what you use for the treatment of cancers. Many, many years later, decades later, I would say 70 years later, when I was a PhD student in America, trying to learn the technique of nuclear magnetic resonance, my supervisor walked in one afternoon at lunchtime and said he wanted to tell us about a new experiment which had been done by a friend of his. What his friend had done was he had taken two glass tubes of water, concentric tubes, and then put them into another bigger tube and imaged water using nuclear resonance signals. You don't have to understand what he did. He used inhomogeneous magnetic fields, but he created the image that you see on the top right of the slide. He called this a zeugmatogram, and nobody knew why he called it a zeugmatogram. But later on, this is what became magnetic resonance imaging. Today, if you have a headache, and you go to a neurologist, he might send you off to get an MRI scan done. MRI scans now are there everywhere. Paul Lauterbur, whose experiment this is, received the Nobel Prize many, many years later. So the two major techniques of diagnostic radiology, X-rays on the, the beginning, magnetic resonance imaging, both of these are products of the same physics, the same physics that gave us the atom bomb. It also turns out it was first called nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, but the N was removed because the term nuclear has a bad connotation in public perception. 
Look at Raman's discovery. What was Raman worried about? He was worried about the color of the sea. The Mediterranean Sea, which he saw for the first time, was a nice blue. And he wondered what it was. Lord Raleigh had suggested that, what is that which comes on my screen? Uh, it was there before, it was removed. Now it's obscuring my slides. I'm so sorry, sir. We are just, we're just just erased it. Yeah. It's done. Thank you, sir. Fine. Thank you. Uh, Raman was worried about the color of the sea, a natural phenomenon. Lord Raleigh suggested that it was the reflection of the sky on the water. Raman then began to study the scattering of light from liquids because he felt that scattering might be important here. And he discovered what we today call the Raman effect. Now you might ask, he's understood a fundamental effect in physics. It tells us a great deal about molecular structure. And you can see, ah, that wonderful thing keeps coming on my slide every now and then. Uh, and Raman now had discovered an effect whose origins can be understood only if you understand quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics is precisely what you need in order to understand the structure of the atom and eventually to understand what nuclear fission is all about. But look at this. Today, where is the Raman effect used? does that happen? Do you know? Uh, maybe if uh, nobody touches something on their screens, maybe this will not come. Look at the kind of effects. It's used to study the universe. It's used to study molecules in the universe. It's used to study, uh, it's today used in airport security as handheld Raman scanners. It was used to A, determine whether it was blood on the Shroud of Turin. All of this can be done with Raman spectroscopy. Ah, now we've changed colors. Ah. I'm asking for three questions here. What is science? How is science done? And is science useful? I've simply illustrated this with cartoons that I have picked up off the internet. And many times people make jokes of science. Uh, for example, physicists discover, talking to one another say, and your mama thinks Newton's second law replaced Newton's first law. I suspect that this is some very clever student uh, trying to do something to the slides. I wish... Uh, he has demonstrated his capabilities, and uh, we are deeply appreciative of that. And maybe he will have a bright future in computer science. Or I should be gender neutral and say he or she would have a bright future in computer science. Uh, what is nature? Or what do scientists study? Oh, wonderful. He's conversing with me. Okay, thanks. Great. Uh, congratulations. You should message me after the talk is over so that I can find out who this is. This is the first time that it's been done. Uh, I won't really reveal your name. Uh, what does science do? Science is the study of nature. And uh, how do you define nature? In fact, two of the most important journals in science, one of the first ones is called Nature, and the other one which is very important is called Science. But actually, science is the study of nature. If you go back to the first, I don't know what he says. I says, maybe he says, you live long, I hope. Uh, it seems, uh, it seems the Pali Dao, some student or maybe somebody who is doing this. Uh, right, sir. Some student is creating some kind of nuisance. Uh, uh, can we fix it? 
no, I think one way of doing this is to uh, prevent everybody from actually getting on. Uh, please stop your mouse and cursors on using on the screen because the presentation is going on. Please, it's distracting the presentation now. Dipali Dao, please. Thank you very much for being so kind. Uh, the, how do you define nature? You can go back to the first volume of the journal Nature, which appeared in 1869. November of 1869, and the famous biologist Thomas Huxley was asked to write an editorial for this first volume. He did not write the editorial. Instead, what he did was he translated an essay written in the 18th century by the German poet von Goethe. And what Goethe said was this, that nature, we are surrounded and embraced by her, powerless to separate ourselves from her and powerless to penetrate beyond her. This is a quote which you should keep in mind when you try to define what nature really is. Human beings are a part of nature. I want to draw your attention to a book called The Ascent of Man. This is based on a BBC television series which appeared in the 1970s. And it was done by the mathematical physicist, Jacob Bronowski. Bronowski grew up in very difficult years. You can see that he was born in 1908. So he lived through the two wars, came to England, learned English, gave the BBC, docu made the BBC documentaries many years later. And that's what's the book. He says here, among the multitude of animals that scamper, fly, burrow, and swim around us, man is the only one who's not locked into his environment. His imagination, his reason, his emotional subtlety and toughness make it possible for him not to accept the environment, but to change it. And that series of inventions by which man from age to age has remade his environment is a different kind of evolution, not biological, a cultural evolution. I call that brilliant sequence of cultural peaks, the ascent of man. Why do I quote this today? Because the word culture today in India is sometimes misunderstood. Every cultural peak that Bronowski traced in the ascent of man is based on an advance in science and technology. From the invention of fire, from the invention of stone tools, from the domestication of horses, to the invention of agriculture and dairy farming, Everything is an advance in science and technology. All that the Industrial Revolution did was it speeded it up. Sometimes in the course of human history, science has also driven war. But it's not science which has driven war. It is war which has driven science. Because human beings are constantly warring with one another. And this is, of course, the course of history. What is science based on? There was an article two years ago called The Science Tool, which I read in Scientific American. I have simply decorated it. It was an essay. The stool has three legs. It stands on data, it stands on theory, and it stands on communication. I have illustrated the four corners of the slide with four individuals. Copernicus, who gave us our first ideas in modern science of the universe. William Harvey, who actually discovered blood circulation. Edward Jenner, who gave us the first vaccine, and vaccines are important. And Darwin, who gave us our idea of how to understand nature. But scientists, to progress science, need tools. I show you just two of the tools of science. Galileo's telescope. Once he had the telescope and pointed it to the skies, he saw the stars, the planets, everything very nicely. So he then discovered the entire field of cosmology. Leeuwenhoek, a Dutchman, made the microscope. And once he had invented the microscope, he looked at a drop of tap water. And what did he see? He saw bacteria swimming in the tap water. He discovered an unknown world of biology, microbiology. We all know today what bacteria are, what viruses are, thanks to the pandemic. 
What are the ways of doing science? The ways of doing science are you can observe and you can classify. So look around you and classify. The true exemplars of this are Mendeleev, who gave us the periodic table, and Darwin, who gave us the ideas of natural selection. But there are other ways of doing science. You can look at the work of Pasteur, for example. He introduced the idea of experiment and observation. So you do something in the laboratory and then you observe. And he gave us the famous dictum, chance favors the prepared mind. Chance does favor the prepared mind because if you're always doing experiments, if you're always observing and thinking about it, you will find something. Science progressed very fast, and I take here just the example of physics and chemistry. Michael Faraday, he gave us electromagnetic induction, the connection between electricity and magnetism. I tell you a story here. If I ask students the question, do you know which is the first one-way street in the world? Today in all our metropolitan cities, almost every street is a one-way street because of traffic jams. The first one-way street is the street in front of the Royal Institution in London. And this is where on a long desk and an old amphitheater, Faraday would perform his experiments. Who came to see him? They were the Victorian ladies. The Victorian ladies with their long dresses who would not walk. They would come in horse-drawn carriages, park right in front of the steps of the Royal Institutions and go in to see Faraday do his experiments. Science was popular then because Faraday was making these marvelous demonstrations. It's there that he demonstrated the collection between the electric and the magnetic fields and introduced us to the idea that these two might in fact be related to one another. But unification required theory. That theory came some years later from Clark Maxwell where in physics, first major unification, we unified electricity and magnetism, and out of it came light. And we then realized that light was electromagnetic radiation. We understood light. On the other person pictured on the slide is Boltzmann. Boltzmann gave us the idea of entropy. Today, entropy is a term which has entered the English language. We say that our cities are very high entropy places because there's a lot of disorder. But what was Boltzmann's study? Boltzmann was asking a fundamental question. What is heat? You know that objects get hot. What is heat? And he then understood that this must be due to the motion of particles. What are those? Those are atoms now. Then he said that heat is not material any more than fire is or any more than life is. Heat is a random motion of atoms. The very same atoms that we began with when we discussed Hiroshima. Atoms are there everywhere in physics and in chemistry. And entropy is a measure of the disorder that they have. In order to appreciate some of the aspects of science, physics, sometimes students appreciate because they understand motion. They understand gravity or they experience it. I shouldn't say they understand it, I should say they experience it motion, the experience gravity. Mathematics and chemistry are somewhat more abstract. Galileo said a long time ago that mathematics is the language with which God wrote the universe. I might paraphrase this and say, chemistry is the language with which nature wrote the book of life. Chemistry and mathematics are difficult to appreciate because you need to learn another language before you study. For chemistry, it is the language of molecular formula and structures, chemical structures. Most people do not understand what they are. For mathematics, it is the symbols and the equations which are the alphabet and language of mathematics. So you must learn these languages first before you can understand mathematics and chemistry. But is chemistry important? It's a subject that I study and I migrated to biology. One of the 20th century's most famous biochemist, Arthur Kornberg, he discovered the enzyme DNA polymerase and fired what I believe is the first shot of the biotechnology revolution. 
Hanberg, in his later years, wrote an essay where he called chemistry the lingua franca of the medical and biological sciences. It is. Because remember that everything around you is chemical in nature. Today, one of the saddest parts of Indian medical education is the very small amount of attention that is paid to chemistry in the education of physicians. What are the foundational pillars of chemistry? Foundational pillars of chemistry are diversity, unity, dynamics, and structure. Mendeleev, Wohler, Boltzmann, and Kaminsky. I will just tell you one of them. Wohler, what did he do? Wohler took an inorganic substance, ammonium cyanate, and he did it. What he got is a substance, urea. And urea is found in urine, and already scientists knew this in the 19th century. And then he wrote a letter to another famous chemist, Berzelius. He said, in a manner of speaking, I can no longer hold my chemical water. I must tell you that I can make urea without the use of kidneys of any animal, be it man or dog. What had he done? He had transformed in what were considered in those days as inorganic molecules, inanimate molecules, into organic molecules or the molecules of life, molecules which are found, chemicals which are found in biochemistry. But if you think about biochemistry, you think about life, you think about humanity, you have to ask, where did everything come from? Where did all this matter come from? It, of course, came when the Earth was formed in a gigantic explosion after the Big Bang. But Bronowski asked this question. He says, in all the stars that are going on processes which build up the atoms one by one into more complex structures, he then says, matter itself evolves. The word comes from Darwin in biology, but it is the word that changed physics in my lifetime. Today, I think the word evolution must be used more in terms of cultures, how we define cultures. Cultural evolution is what will take us to a world without war. The word evolution is very important. He describes car the formation of carbon in poetic fashion. Carbon, for instance, is formed in a star and three helium nuclei collide at one spot within less than one millionth of a millionth of a second, 10 raised to minus 12 of a second. Every carbon atom in every living creature has been formed by such a wildly improbable collision. Why did I say this? Life itself is highly improbable. In the vast universe that surrounds us, there are not many planets on which life is likely to be there like this. And when life is very improbable, life is precious. And the one thing that we must remember on the anniversary of Hiroshima is that life is precious. Very often, even in today's discourse, which we hear every day from the leaders of every country, including ours, is that life can be very cheap. Chemistry is all around us. I show you two advertisements, a Western advertisement and an Indian advertisement. And... Uh, they're both the same, chemical free cleaning products. And here again, we have an advertisement from your own state which says, uh, stop punishing your hands with chemical based phenyl. Science teaches us that nothing is chemical free. Everything on earth is a chemical. If you pick up the sand, it's chemical. If you pick up the grass, it's chemical. You are chemical. Everything is chemical. This is why chemistry is important. I illustrate this with this cartoon. Here's a man solving a crossword puzzle. And he turns and asks a question to the lady sitting by his side. What's a nine letter word for biotechnology? A very popular word today. And she's very good. She immediately answers chemistry. I will also ask you, what is a nine letter word for material science? That's also chemistry. So chemistry is all pervading. I'll show you an example of chemistry now. When the 20th century was ending and the 21st century was beginning, in the year 1999 and the year 2000, everybody was interested in what the new century would bring, what the new millennium would bring. And everyone was analyzing what has the old century brought us and what has the old millennium brought us. 
So the journal Nature commissioned a series of essays, one page essays, where people were asked to write what they thought was the most important scientific advance of the 20th century. You know what the 20th century has done in science. Hiroshima is an example. The one essay which has remained in my mind, which I read then, is this one by the Canadian scientist Václav Smil. His essay was titled The Detonator of the Population Explosion. And he said that the most important scientific discovery of the 20th century was the Harbour Bosch synthesis of ammonia, which is at the heart of chemistry classes, even in the 10th and 12th classes today. Nobody likes it. I was intrigued. And what Mel says is this. He says the world might be better off without Microsoft and CNN. We need Microsoft for today's discussion. And neither nuclear reactors nor space shuttles are critical to human well-being. But the world's population would not have grown from 1.6 billion to today's 6 billion without the Harbour Bosch process. What is the Harbour Bosch process? It's the industrial synthesis of ammonia from gaseous nitrogen and gaseous hydrogen at high pressure, high temperature. This is what teaches us in chemistry the law of mass action and Le Chatelier's principle. Subjects which even chemistry students dislike in later years. But why is ammonia important? Because it is from ammonia that you make urea. And urea was the first fertilizer which led to the first agricultural revolution of the 20th century. Before that, more people died from famines than from wars and disease. The second agricultural revolution, of course, was that which was driven by biology. That is the green revolution of the 1970s. The last famine in India took place when I was a student, when I was in a college hostel, and when Lal Bhadur Shastri had asked us all to forego a meal every Monday so that food could be conserved. Nature makes ammonia also because it is needed for life. Nitrogen is there everywhere. This is called nitrogen fixation. It does it wonderfully at room temperature and an aqueous solution, but it does it with the help of enzymes. But Fritz Haber, who gave us the Haber Bosch synthesis, received the Nobel Prize, one of the most important German scientists of his time, was also the man who led the first chemical warfare attack in the First World War, 22nd of April, 1915, Harbour personally directed the German chlorine gas attack at Yavres. Those were the days of the trench warfare in the First World War. Harbour's work also led to Zyklon B, which is actually a form of cyanide, which eventually gives you hydrogen cyanide, with which six million Jews were killed by Hitler during the Second World War. Now, you can ask with Harbour. On the one hand, Harbour was responsible for life. On the other hand, Harbour was also responsible for death. He lived a rather agonized end in his life. But then here you will find that chemists have actually written essays on this, hoping with Fritz Harbour's somber literary shadow. One thing I must say when I heard your vice chancellor say that scientists sometimes are philosophers, it turns out that when you do science, many, many scientists turn to literature, to history, to poetry. You very rarely see literary figures turning to science for anything. If they did that, maybe the world would be enriched. He says here that this leads to the stereotype presentation of a chemist, or in fact a scientist, as an immoral character, having sold his soul to the devil. Remember, we have all sold our souls to the devils, and very often those devils are the leaders to lead you into war. So it is not the scientists who are responsible. And they say here that the betrayal is not only personal, but that of humanity. Fritz Haber is often the scapegoat. Fritz Haber was a scapegoat in this particular case, just as the way Oppenheimer was many years later. Oppenheimer died a very unhappy man. Fritz Haber also died a very unhappy man. Science is other things. DDT, for instance, it was found during the war, immediately discovered that it was very efficient as a contact poison against several insects. 
These were the insects which caused damage in agriculture and also the malarial mosquito. So immediately DDT was used for eradication of mosquitoes and eradication of pests in fields. It was so effective that it fetched Mueller the Nobel Prize in medicine a few years later. But in the early 1960s, a nurse, Rachel Carson, wrote this book, Silent Spring. This is the classic book that has been described as launching the environmental movement. Today, protecting the environment is popular and protecting biodiversity is popular. But the environmental movement began when we realized the toxic effects of chemicals that one is spraying into fields. What Carson said should be remembered on Hiroshima Day. He says, we are rightly appalled by the genetic effects of radiation. This is what brought the tragedy of nuclear war to the forefront. The genetic effects which were last, long lasting rather than the casualties which were su suffered on those days. Then she says, how then can we be indifferent to the same effect in chemicals that we disseminate widely in our environment? This is the debate today about the use of pesticides in agriculture. Again, pesticides are the bodies of science, but it's science also which teaches you that pesticides may be harmful and we should find other ways of getting rid of pests. I turn to biology, Darwin. I read you just one sentence from The Origin of Species. Darwin's view is wonderful, natural selection, adaptation, evolution. He says, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one. And that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Life is still a work in progress. There are three pillars of modern biology. I told you the pillars of chemistry. Two of those pillars were erected in the 19th century. Darwin's ideas on evolution by variation and selection, and Mendel's ideas of genetics. Everyone understands genetics, because when a newborn baby is looked, friends go to visit the parents, they look at the baby and say immediately, it resembles the mother or the father. They know that phenotypic characteristics are transmitted to generations. Very often the baby resembles neither of them at that stage, but everybody is happy. How do, does information transmit from generation to generation? But still it's not the same. Children are not the same as their parents. And there is variation. How does this happen? This happens because of mutations in the genetic material. These mutations are spontaneous and natural. And the third foundational pillar is chemistry. This was erected in the 20th century when Oswald Avery discovered that DNA is the transforming principle. DNA is the molecule which contains the genetic information. Watson and Crick gave us the double helical structure. Because we gave us the double helical structure, it's a chemical structure. We know that the base pairs, adenine and guanine, Phytosine, thymine, they all pair together, specific pairs, A and T, G and C. This is the basis of information transfer in biology. DNA today is a common word in the English language. Nobody understands the word DNA better than politicians. Well, every time I open a newspaper, the BJP will say that dynastic politics is in the DNA of the Congress. And the Congress will say communalism is in the DNA of the BJP. So they have now adopted the word DNA. So on a day when we are trying to commemorate science, we must understand that science has provided us with many things other than the destructive force of the atom. We now understand DNA. We have DNA sequences for all the information. If the book of life is embedded in DNA, then we can read many books of life. We can read the book of life of all the organisms. So from 2000 onwards, over the last 20 years, the last two decades, so many genomes have been done. And you can compare them and do comparative genomics and draw what is called an evolutionary tree. I show you this tree not because I want you to understand the tree, but largely I want to show you 
what the tree means. On one major branch of the tree with two sub branches come human beings, chimpanzees, rats, mice, pigs, cattle, sheep, horses, and dogs. What biology teaches you is the unity of nature. Pigs, cattle, and sheep are not very far away. But I know that in India, because of religious prejudices, we often fight over, we fight over pigs, we fight over cows, but biology teaches us that pigs and cows are close to one another. Biology also teaches us that we never drank milk until the invention of dairy farming. Human beings existed long before. Your ancestors were not there 3,000 years ago. Your ancestors were there 30,000 years ago. They were there almost a million years ago. Like all animals, they were hunter-gatherers. Like all animals, they were weaned after birth from mother's milk. They never drank milk. So, uh, cultural evolution has what determined dairy farming, which is a scientific invention, has driven cultures and habits. There are two dominant technologies of our time. And today, when we are trying to understand science, I must tell you, that the two major technologies we worry about, information technology and biotechnology, both have their roots in fundamental science. Average establishment of DNA, the genetic material, is the foundational mark of uh, biotechnology. Claude Shannon's work on information theory, the mathematical theory of communication, also in the 1940s, is the starting point of uh, information technology. History is very important, not only in understanding human affairs. History is also important in understanding science. And very often, science has determined the course of human history. Today, we are in the midst of a pandemic caused by a virus. And you might ask, is a virus a living organism or not? Does the virus belong to chemistry or does the virus belong to biology? The virus is not a free living organism. It can only live inside you. So it can go from person to person. It's a parasitic organism. It cannot replicate by itself. It needs you. But scientists still debate this. You will find papers which say 10 reasons to exclude viruses from the kingdom of life. And the other one which says, do viruses exchange genes across the super kingdoms of life? Which means, if you look at the human genome, you will find footprints of our past interactions with viruses over the last millions of years. They are there. Many, many thousands of years later, millions of years later, maybe the coronavirus footprints will also remain. And our descendants will analyze them. Between chemistry and biology, there is really no difference. It's a question of length scales and time scales. Molecules are small, biological objects are bigger, and I simply show you a slide from the internet which illustrates them. The viruses right, right in the middle, flanked on one side by the ribosome, an organelle in a cell, and mitochondria, another organelle in a cell. The ribosome is important for making proteins. The mitochondria is important for generating energy. In between them is sandwich the virus. So it is an object, a chemical object, just like the others. I can't end my lecture without referring to the burden of the coronavirus pandemic, because we began with the burden of nuclear war. Today, over 4 million people have died. This was on the 1st of July, the number is larger. This number is an underestimate. It is likely that probably 6 to 7 million people might have actually died. Between the United States and India, two of what are considered the largest democracies of the world, one million people have died already, and this is the official death toll. In China, the numbers have been smaller. They appear to be growing now, but the numbers are not reliable. There has been a remarkable toll, and you can see from the daily case charts here, the pandemic is not quite over as yet. What is a virus? One of the best definitions that I found is in this dictionary of biology, which is called a philosophical dictionary of biology, Aristotle to Zeus. So if you go under A, you will find Aristotle. 
If you get go to Z, you will find zoos. Written by the English immunologist, Nobel Prize winning immunologist, Peter Medawa. He says, inasmuch as viruses are made known only by their causing disease or other pathological changes, the existence of benign viruses having no ill effect remains conjectural. No virus is known to do good. It has been well said that a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. The bad news is the nucleic acid, which is the genetic information of the virus. The protein is what allows it to invade our host cells. Look at the coronavirus. It is again an object of nature. Scientists have now pictured the coronavirus by electron microscopy, by three-dimensional reconstruction of the virus, and so forth. And look at it. It's beautiful. It's symmetric, spherical, dotted with the, the spike protein on its surface. That's the protein against which the vaccines are being made. That's the protein which allows the virus to bind to the host cell and get inside. That is the Trojan horse which attacks the virus into the host cell. Now we might ask, where did the coronavirus come from? Is it natural evolution or is it a laboratory creation, a creation of science? Much in the way the atom bomb was a creation of science. We don't know as yet, there is a controversy, but today biology has the techniques to create such organisms. This would be the basis of what one might call biological warfare. And there are biological warfare conventions. But with the world being as it is, polarized between, the, between China, Russia, the United States, uh, India, the rest of the world, and so on, it is very unlikely that politicians will come to any reasonable conclusion on all of this. Most politicians today are ignorant of what science has done. And they often display their ignorance in their public statements, whether it is in the United States or elsewhere. So we can ask this question. Now, this question has been asked before by poets who have looked at nature. The English poet William Blake, in the 18th century, simply looked at two creations of nature, the lamb on the one hand and the tiger on the other. He wrote a poem on the lamb and he wrote a poem on the tiger. What do you see when you see the lamb and the tiger? Both are beautiful. One is fearsome also, in addition to being beautiful, just like the coronavirus. Beautiful, but fearsome. The lamb is beautiful, and you would like to hold it. Both of them show you bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry is when you cut yourself along your long axis. Your two halves, left and right, are mirror images of one another. You see symmetry. The coronavirus is a beautifully symmetric object. But in the poem called The Tiger, Blake wrote this, and I must quote it to you. He says, What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Effectively, he's asking a question for both the lamb and the tiger the product of natural creation. Who made the lamb? Who made the tiger? They're asking the same question now, a couple of centuries later, about the coronavirus. If the coronavirus is a product of laboratory creation, why do we think that it might be? Because the techniques exist. And that's why there's a doubt. Have the techniques been used, for instance? Why have they been used if they've been used? There's no evidence to say that they've been. We don't know. We are suspicious. I will end with this quote from two novels which I have read when I was young, both of them by a novelist who wrote somewhat interesting spy novels which were not like the modern ones, John Le Carr. He says, survival is an infinite capacity for suspicion. And then he also says that if you read the literature on this, and this is what one does with the coronavirus, a desk is a dangerous place from which to watch the world. And all that I've done in the last one and a half years of the pandemic is to watch the world from a desk and learn many things, some of which I've shared with you today. 
I will skip over this particular thing because I'm coming to 11.30. I don't want to tell you this. But I want to end by just asking, drawing your attention to something. When you look at science and you look at the origins of life on Earth, you must remember that we now know that the life is five and a half billion years old. That is 5,500 million years old. Life on Earth began with bacteria, archaebacteria, about three billion years ago or so. That was a Earth without oxygen. It was only later that oxygen came and photosynthetic organisms evolved and the grand oxygenation event took place somewhere about two billion years ago. Then only the Earth's atmosphere got enriched in oxygen. Today we all know because of the pandemic the importance of oxygen. Our lungs need oxygen. So aerobic life as we know it is two and a half billion years old. Many animals came first. Plants came later. Microbiology came much earlier. The dinosaurs came and went. Human beings and their precursors, the precursors of Homo sapiens, hominins and primates, monkeys, came very much later, much after the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs died 66 million years ago in a grand extinction event. This is known by science. But one might ask if biology is so complicated, where did all the chemicals come from? The chemicals might have come on Earth when it formed. It might have also come from comets when comets bombarded the early Earth. And there are many, many chemicals that scientists have now analyzed in Comets, everything from water to formaldehyde to hydrogen cyanide is present in comets. These could be the building blocks for the chemistry of life. But we can ask a question, why is life the way it is? This is asked in this book by Nick Lane, The Vital Question. Bacteria evolved into complex life just once in four billion years of life on Earth. All complex life shares many strange properties. Sex, aging, death. Life evolved on other planets. Would it be the same or would it be completely different? It's a grand question. You can ask. How did we come to be the way we are? How did we come to Hiroshima? If you look at 200,000 BC, this is the kind of thing that you will find on history sites on the internet. Human populations were restricted to the east of Africa, the little gray shade that you see at the east of Africa. It's from there that the precursors of modern human beings emerged. This is 200,000 years ago. 200,000 is a number that all of you can remember now because we now deal with much larger numbers when we deal with money. 32,000 BC, the gray shade has spread. There are still no civilizations 32,000 years ago. So when we fight about our ancestors, remember, that all our ancestors were in fact common. 2000 years ago, civilizations have now come. India, China, the Middle East, not yet too much in Europe, but it's coming. Americas are still virgin. How would we track all this movement of human beings? We would do it with ancient DNA analysis today. It's a field which is developing because fossils are there, DNA can be extracted from individuals who lived tens of thousands of years ago, and this analysis will tell us where our ancestors migrated from. Lastly, a question. Hiroshima is a historical remembrance, a very recent historical remembrance. Is there any connection between history and biology? This is what biology is what we discuss when we talk about evolution. To read this book, Apiens by Harari, Yuval Harari, an Israeli historian, with a very good understanding of biology, if you haven't read it. What he says is that the immense diversity of imagined realities that sapiens invented and the resulting diversity of behavior patterns are the main components of what we call culture. Once cultures appear, they never cease to change and develop. And these unstoppable alterations are what we call history. So 32,000 years ago, we were hunter-gatherers. We had limited language. We were rather close to the animals. We were governed by the laws of biology. 
He then adds, the cognitive revolution is accordingly the point when history declared its independence from biology. It is true. It is the evolution of the brain, the capacities for language, the capacities for emotions. These are what have driven human history over the last 30,000 years. He then says, to understand the rise of Christianity or the French Revolution, it is not enough to comprehend the interactions of genes, hormones, and organisms. It is necessary to take into account the interaction of ideas, images, fantasies as well. I want you to think about this on Hiroshima Day. Most of the ideas which we, we work, what we call cultures, what we jealously guard, what differentiate us, language, culture, religion, these are ideas, these are images, and sometimes they are fantasies as well. In concluding my lecture, on what I would say is a day on which uh, scientists must look back and ask the question, what has science done over the last 200 years? It has done a great deal of good. It has also told us that a great deal of harm can also be done by the new technologies which are developed. Science is a double-edged sword. Using science wisely is important, but you must ask the question, who uses science? It's the people. How do the people use science? They use it through their leaders. Who are their leaders? Those whose judgments are clouded and those who are often steeped in prejudice. I must acknowledge at the end of my lecture, the two institutions where I have spent much of my life and my entire professional career, except when I was being educated, the Indian Institute of Science at the top left, where I spent 42 years, and the National Center for Biological Sciences in the bottom right, where I've been, which has given me shelter in my days of retirement. Thank you very much. Dr. Aram, uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I thank you very much, sir, for such an enlightening lecture. Once upon a time, I heard that you are the best orator in Indian science. And today, after listening to you, I am feeling as if, you know, I'm very much enlightened. I learned a lot about what science has done, what is the importance of science. And uh, it was, I'm having a firm belief that it was enlightening for everyone, for all of us, sir. Thank you very much for being with us and uh, enlightening us. Sir, uh, now the session is open for questions and answers. I uh, request uh, my colleagues uh, to discuss and interact with sir. And I also invite students to discuss their queries with sir. Sir, I think uh, a student will take some time. Sir, I have a very, uh, uh, I'm curious to know and I would like to know from you. Actually, I'm also belonging to chemistry background. Sir, I know about the chemical processes. I know about the scientific processes. But when I joined Noon University, I'm having a very senior colleague. He is from sociology background. His name is Professor Harsh Dobhal. He told me about the social processes. So I would, uh, I would be very happy if you say something about the correlation between scientific processes and social processes. You know, this, I would rephrase your question. Um, when we talk about processes, I would talk about evolution. And one can ask the question, is cultural evolution different from biological evolution? Yes, it is, and people do analyze this. Sometimes papers on this appear in journals of science. Cultural evolution happens in much shorter timescales. Uh, 
Biological evolution happens by genetic transmission, which happens on long time scales. Like for example, human generations take many decades uh, of transmission. So we evolve slowly, but cultural evolution happens very, very quickly nowadays. And it is the effect of environment on human behavior. But sometimes there is a connection between behavior and the biology and chemistry which underlie that behavior. Today, for example, people are studying this. For example, there's a hormone called oxytocin. This is used very much, it's a pituitary hormone, but it is used in pregnancy to cause immediate uterine contraction. That's what it's been used all these years. Today, scientists have found that oxytocin works also on the brain, and today it is called the love hormone. And it's give, beginning to give rise to a field called social neuroscience. So I can see that in the future, as we understand more about the chemical basis of neural phenomena, there will be more and more connections between social behavior and uh, what I would call a chemical processes in the brain. Uh, Dr. Arun, can I yes, ask? I... Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so I'm SP Sati. I'm also a faculty. I'm, um, I'm a geologist. I want to know that in the coming years, when the socio-political ethos of the globe is very different and chaotic, in this era, what will be the what is the possibility of the fusion of uh, biology and this algorithm and what will be the possible consequences if it is not changed? The present ethos is not changed. You see, the present ethos in which the world is appears to be much more dangerous uh, than it was a few years ago. This is largely due to the rise of what one might call, uh, I can only use a word which many people will not like, I will call it tribal nationalism throughout the world. Biology would view the human species as one species. And uh, normally there should not be so much of uh, discord, violence and warfare internally. This does not happen in biology usually. It does happen, for example, in rats when they become overpopulated. But otherwise, I think in the modern era, it should not happen. But I think this is a subject which all of you should worry about. You should worry about how uh, what we call cultural attributes, language, nationality, uh, religion, all of these are used more to divide people than to unify them. And I think this will come only if you have an understanding of biology. You must not listen to uh, the large mass of people must not listen to leaders who lead them up the wrong way. That is the moral of the story. It's the moral of the First World War. It's the moral of the Second World War. It will be the moral of any future war that is there also. Sir, uh, uh, thank you, sir. Sir, uh, we have a very senior faculty. Her name is Professor Kusum Arunachalam. She has posted a question in the chat box. She is saying that Indian academic and research institutions are striving hard to make a mark in quality teaching and research. Indian Institute of Science Bangalore has been ranked to be the top institution across the world. 
So she wants to know from you, what could you suggest to improve research ecosystem in universities, especially in state universities? Now, I must first tell Dr. Arunachalam that I would not take the ranking of Indian institutions very seriously. All Indian institutions, including the Indian Institute of Science, have a long way to go. And all of them must be constantly trying to improve the internal ambience of the institutions. But what has happened in Indian institutions is that academic work appears to have taken a back seat. And Indian institutions are often led by people who pay much less attention to academic matters than they pay attention to many other matters which happen inside their institution. Today, for example, uh, functions with politicians uh, uh, are far more important than any academic event that happens in a university. Very often, even seminars and things are not held very often. But I won't only blame heads of the institution. If you go down, you go to the departments, heads of the department. If you come down, the professors in the department. Very often, most people don't seem to be interested in the academic activities that they are pursuing. If they were interested in those academic activities, they would create an environment, an ecosystem. No, Homi Baba said many years ago that uh, most people require an ecosystem to work, but only one in a thousand can create that ecosystem. We need those one in a thousand people to create that ecosystem where academic activity thrives. Today, if you have a Japanese studies department, I was very impressed by this, that you have a Japanese studies department, which now connects a very unfortunate chapter in Japanese history and its relationship to science to have a discussion. This would be a rare occasion in which someone from Japanese studies and someone from a science background are actually even listening to one another. This will broaden people's horizons. If you don't study history, if you don't study literature, if you don't read, uh, uh, even if you're an academic, you may be a professor, but you are limited now. If you want to consider humanity on a grand scale, uh, science is only one component. Maybe the most, in, in my view, it may be the most important and most determined component. But still, uh, I think you should encourage students to do far more reading, far more extracurricular things, uh, faculty too. Uh, uh, you, for, for, usually you learn things from students. Uh, almost everything that I've learned is in some discussion with the other with someone. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, we are having a colleague, Dr. Rashi Mishra from School of Media Communication. She wants to know how could aesthetics of science be beneficial for the technology-based mindset, which mostly rely on experimentation, but superstitions prevails though. No, I, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Mishra, you're actually asking the wrong person this question because I personally believe that aesthetics is very important. Uh, you know, I would like sometimes to study a molecule just before it looks beautiful. And uh, very many times uh, beauty also sometimes conveys something else. I'll give you just one example. Uh, there is this beautiful molecule, a hydrocarbon, 60 carbon atoms all in one called fullerene. It's called Buckminster Fullerene after the uh, famous architect Buckminster Fuller. But when Harry Trotter, the chemist, actually found it by accident and uh, he uh, analyzed it and then he found he got a molecular mass of 720. It had only carbon. Carbon's mass is 12. So it must have 60 carbon atoms. How can you put 60 carbon atoms on a football? If you look, you can put it. So the aesthetics of the football 
led him to the structure. The structure led him to a Nobel Prize. And the title of his Nobel lecture is The Celestial Sphere That Fell to Earth. So it just came into his life. And it's the aesthetics which attracted everybody. I think aesthetics is very important. Many applications of Buckminster Fuller in afterwards, graphene and other things which have come, have come because of that discovery. Beauty is very important. Uh, I think there is beauty when you actually find something, you know, you solve a problem. Uh, it might be a biosynthetic pathway, you understood how a molecule is made, it's beautiful. The Watson Crick double helix, it's immortal because it's beautiful. Uh, I think aesthetics is very important. You'd say uh, my experimentation doesn't bother uh, many experimentalists and I'm one. Uh, we might still appreciate wonderful looking objects, but uh, superstition is something else. I mean, when uh, I would leave superstitions aside because if it makes people happy to be superstitious and they don't damage anybody else, they're welcome to have their superstitions. Uh, the physicist Niels Bohr had a horseshoe hanging in front of his door. So someone asked him, are you superstitious? Why have you put the horseshoe there? He said, no, I'm not superstitious. But if it does any good, let it be there. So I don't have any objection to people being superstitious, to people being religious, everything. Should not damage anybody else. That's the only uh, requirement because your mind is a very complicated uh, organ, organ. So if you feel happy, be happy. And the happier you are, the less unhappy you are likely to make other people. Uh, so this principle should be followed. Uh, thank you, sir. Sir, uh, we are having a senior research associate, Dr. Somdat at our department. He is asking, he is saying, sir, your contribution in the field of protein folding and secondary structure conformations of peptides is tremendous and is internationally recognized. I have also heard you earlier in IIT Kanpur during my MSc. I am a chemical biologist and I want to know what area you think should be given high focus at the interface of chemistry and biology. You know, I must tell you, Somdat, that I will not tell you an area. The interface between chemistry and biology is a very large border. It's rather like the border between India and China, very, very long. And chemistry has made many inroads into biology, and biology has made many inroads into chemistry. So I would call this border the line of actual control. But this is one line of actual control which must be crossed all the time in interdisciplinary action. And uh, you must look at chemistry as being able to contribute to every aspect of biology. And you should find the problem which interests you. Never ever look at problems which interest other people. Because if you find your own problems, you then are passionately involved in trying to solve them. And uh, this will be the best. You also know what it is that you can do in your environment. Because experimentation requires facilities and so on, infrastructure, money. And environments are limited. But in every environment, very good work can be done. So I would encourage you to look with enthusiasm at every chemical problem in biology and ask the question, can, can I do something about it? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I request Dr. Vipul Goswami. He is asking to appear and ask some question. So Dr. Vipul, you can switch on, turn on your camera and uh, uh, interact with sir directly. So uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Vipul Goswami. I am an assistant professor for German here. I have recently joined. Uh, First of all, thank you very much for your so such insightful talk on the, the very relevant uh, topic today. Uh, it certainly has uh, inculcated and then tried 
like increase my interest also on certain topics on sciences. Uh, my question is actually related to the misuse of science because you mentioned of uh, uh, Fritz Haber and then how his research was misused in this uh, trench warfare in First World War. Um, and then it is kind of a dilemma for like a, a German teacher here also because it is sometimes because to teach sometimes students who are certainly not very great idea of European history to explain them it was actually one particular political party and not complete Germany who was so evil and it was kind of a takeover of Germany and then made use of all German advancements into the all destruction which happened during the first and second world war so my question is are there any ways like concrete ways to uh, safeguard so that the scientists should not become the scapegoat. No, I think, you know, scientists are part of the system in which they are. Every war has a scapegoat. Okay. Now, if you go back and look at the history of the Second World War and the history of the First World War, you have to understand the events which led to the war. What were the fears of the countries which went to war? Why did they go to war? What were the conditions then prevailing? Germany, before First World War and after First World War, the conditions in Germany after the First World War gave, gave rise to the second. Uh, so one needs to understand this. I think today it's very important for people to understand the history of other countries simply because two countries which are democracies India on the one hand and the United States on the other are teetering on the brink. Both of these are likely to go in, like I am old now, but I hate to think what they would be like 50 years later if they continued in the path in which they are going today. We have not learned the lessons of history, but we don't expect people to, ordinary people to learn the lessons of history because they are not even educated. They are struggling for their day-to-day -day existence. And uh, academics have a big role to play here in trying to understand history and trying to convey to their students what may be there. You need to have debates. You cannot have every debate now curtailed by saying that it is an anti-national sentiment. No. Where nothing is anti-national, nothing is seditious. It is an academic discussion many times. And uh, we need to understand this. Otherwise, what the West did, what happened to the powers which won the First World War? What did they do? They created the conditions for the Second. Now, after winning the Second World War, you create conditions for the Third. Science is only incidental in this process. Uh, you see, one thing is there in universities and your vice chancellor is here. This is a subject which I have never ever understood in, in, in the Indian educational system. It's a subject called political science. First of all, it's not a science. Mm -hmm. So I've always wondered why the science suffix was added there. It could just simply be a politics department. And uh, if it is a department of politics or a department of political theory, what is it that they study in their career? Why is it that students of political science who come out and become politicians afterward, why is it that they have such a poor understanding of human history? This is because they are not educated. They haven't been taught. It's not their fault. It's the fault of the academics. Your curriculum is not good. Today we worry about curricula in science, we worry about curricula in medicine, we worry about curricula in engineering. I've never wondered, I've always wondered whether people in the humanities and social sciences are worried about the curricula at all. I've never heard them. They should be. Because if you, if you are celebrating, or thought I shouldn't say, you're commemorating uh, this day and uh, it's a terrible day. You need to understand why all this happened. Do your students understand? 
Do you understand the partition? Do we understand the Bangladesh uh, creation? What was behind it? No. We are interested in, in instead busy celebrating leaders. Almost every leader in human history has been demonstrated to be a straw man afterwards. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, uh, as you discussed about curricula, in this regard, I have a very relevant query, sir. National education policy will be implemented very soon. In this policy, students will be able to get certificate, diploma, degree, and research degrees. So I want to know, sir, in addition to online teaching, how science and technology be beneficial in the implementation of this policy? I don't know how this policy is going to be implemented. It's certainly not going to be implemented quickly because it's already been in gestation for so many years. And even, so I think, I feel I might be gone by the time that national education policy is actually implemented. I don't believe that universities need to wait for the national education policy to implement anything. Universities have academic autonomy. I think the major problem of Indian in academic institutions is they have not used their autonomy for academic purposes. They've always used their autonomy for administrative and financial purposes, but almost never for academic purposes. Nothing prevents them from starting new courses, new programs, revising curriculum. It is time for academic institutions to stop looking towards government for academic advice. This academic advice is not going to come and it's not going to be good advice. You should look at yourselves. You want to modify the chemistry curriculum? Go ahead. Take people's help and do it. You want to have a new political science course which uh, trains a new generation of people who are interested in politics, go ahead and do it. But the question you have to ask is, where are the teachers? Now, the teachers will have to learn. See, the academic community in India has abdicated its academic responsibilities long ago to government. For everything, you look to government. What, will, what does government know that you don't I have been on many bodies. Suppose I am there formulating a policy. I don't know what course you should teach or what Deepika should teach. I don't know. Uh, you know very well. You might discuss with us. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, Good afternoon, sir. My name is Kalim. I am from Madhya Pradesh. Uh, I want to ask question related to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As we saw on the 6th of August of 1945, one bombing took place on the Hiroshima. So why there was need for another bombing in Nagasaki? Because even in the political science and the history, I read so many hypotheses regarding this. But uh, using the as you also continuously emphasize upon using the science as a double-edged sword or using it as a hegemony. So uh, what is your opinion upon this as using the nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons for the hegemony or for any other purpose? Thank you very much. See, there's no question that no nuclear weapon should be used in the future. If you don't want to... Uh, bring humanity back to biology. If you use nuclear weapons now, you will return to a situation that you were 10,000 years ago. So I don't think nuclear weapons should be used. Biological and chemical weapons should also be banned. And uh, 
countries should abide by this, but it is the political situation in countries which does not permit this. See, we are all prisoners of our history. And if there is one thing that you should learn from Japan and Germany is that they have made enormous efforts to overcome their history. And they have made more progress than all other countries in the last 60, 70 years. Uh, Japan is a model for many other countries. Germany is a model for many other countries. And no one living now really has a very clear idea of what the war was like. And uh, the result of this is that we must also think, you know, we have not been able to, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened in 1945. Look at where Japan is today. The partition took place in 1947. Look at where India and Pakistan are today. Partition, no one living really now has a very, very clear idea. It is stories that they have heard. There are still people who lived at that time, yes. But they've heard stories. And in another 20 years, that will also be forgotten because those people will also be gone. People like me will be gone now. Will be dead. Even I was born after the partition. So, uh, but we retain that memory. We are now retaining memories of even what happened 500 years ago. If you go back to correcting historical wrongs, it will take you back in history. It will take you back to the level where you were hunter gatherers, having destroyed everybody. Leaders must be asked this question, is this what you want? The leader should not be celebrated. Leaders should be questioned. Whether in China, United States, Japan, India, Philippines, Germany, it doesn't matter. Everywhere. Thank you very much, sir, for your answer. It also reminds me one of this piece where I was hearing the Yuval Noah Harari, where he stated that how we are the prisoners of the history and we are again moving towards the world war. If the situation continue in such a way and uh, it's uh, also necessary to get out of all these things and situations as uh, leaders are being celebrated too much, we see we are somehow moving back into the history. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? There is a question in the chat box. Yes, there's a scientific question here. It says, I heard that there are still problems regarding the childbirth in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I would like to know the reasons behind this. I don't know the answer to this, and I don't know how many genetic defects are now still observed in births in these uh, in both the cities, or people who have been in those cities at that time. But one thing was very clear, that uh, radiation has an effect on uh, DNA. And therefore, you can, in fact, if you're irradiated, you can have germline defects, that is, uh, eggs in uh, uh, women and sperm in men. And then these germline defects can then now be transferred to the next generation. So genetic uh, uh, radiation has long-term genetic consequences. I don't know how long that comes. There's a lot of repair mechanisms in biology for repairing damaged DNA, but I do not know over how much the time scales those repair mechanisms will now. I think there must be data in the literature. I do not know what. I would like to ask Mr. Taguchi if he would like to respond to this question, sir. 
Oh, yes, yeah. thank, thank you very much. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I don't think there exists still a birth defect uh, in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, at least uh, uh, in a statistically meaningful uh, number. Well, uh, we already have, you know, we, there was a, we had, it was quite difficult to have recovery uh, direct, directly from the end of the World War II for those two cities. Um, the Japanese population made tremendous efforts to uh, uh, recover. But now we have quite uh, normal lives and ordinary uh, lives there. Uh, very much uh, nothing different from that of uh, Tokyo or, or Osaka. So, uh, the answer is my, my my answer is that I don't think there's uh, still exists such 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 cases. Um, since uh, you have uh, gave me chance to to uh, to, to, to speak, speak well, uh, unfortunately I have to step out uh, due to the time constraints. And thank you very much for today's invocation. Thank you for all this uh, today's. Uh, uh, great uh, occasions and thank you very much professor for your excellent presentations and uh, i hope uh, we all uh, have uh, uh, you all uh, will contrib further contribute to further good uh, japan indian relationships and thank you very much thank you sir before Deep uh, deepika starts uh, sir i want to request uh, that in future we would seek your expertise in academic matters uh, so i request you to be kind enough uh, to accept our invitation whenever it is being sent by sure. our university of course uh, deepika now Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, I know we have exceeded time a little bit, uh, but it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion. As all good things come to an end, so is the session. On behalf of the Department of Japanese Study, School of Languages, Dune University, and Dune University Academic Forum for Combating COVID-19, I take this opportunity to propose a vote of thanks to those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this special session on Hiroshima Day 2021. At the outset, I extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all the speakers. I would like to thank our distinguished keynote speaker, Professor P. Balaram, for enlightening us with their knowledge. Today's lecture was very informative and gave deep insights into the topic. I'm sure the precious knowledge that Professor Balaram shared with us will definitely help us in our studies and future. Further, I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Seichiro Taguchi, Honorable Minister, Political Affairs, Embassy of Japan, New Delhi, for taking out time from the busy schedule to grace the occasion. Thank you, sir, for your very interesting and thought-provoking talk. May I also use this opportunity to express my sincere thanks to the Embassy of Japan, New Delhi, for their cooperation always. We look forward to the same support in future also, sir. I would like to express our profound gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dune University, Professor Surekha Dangwal, for her continued and generous support in organizing the special online session and presence in the session. I am also grateful to Dr. M. S. Mandarwal, Registrar, Tune University, for extending cooperation and support always and presence in the session. I also thank Dr. Arun Kumar, convener, Friday Lecture Series, Tune University, for his continuous effort and helping hand in making this event possible. I also would like to extend my thanks to Mr. Saket, IT Department, for taking care of the technical part. I'm really sorry for the technical problems in between. And I also thank staff to university for their coordination in organization of this event. And most importantly, I would like to thank all the participants, guests, faculties, and students for attending the session and making it a success. 
Once again, I thank you everyone for being with us today. Have a nice day. Thank you.